today's world, many of the problems we face are global in nature. The, the greatest satisfaction people can get from life is making a difference to other people's lives. It's all about building your confidence, facing your fears. That is a legend. From strength to strength you're going. Proper legend to me. Don't know where I'll be without him. If everybody could think like that, that they would get um, so much more satisfaction out of life themselves, uh, and they could transform other people's lives. When we look at the context of where we are in our world and our lives today, the best minds of our time are telling us, in no uncertain terms, we're in trouble here on planet Earth. I feel we are in the time of the greatest creativity available to, to humanity because we have the ability to do something different. The choices we make now have the power to destroy our planet, to destroy each other, to destroy civilization, or to transform it and take it to the next level. Each time the cycle comes to an end, it opens a window of opportunity called a choice point. global crises, the question that many of us are asking is how come we've got all of these technological solutions, we've got the people and the passion, how on earth is it that these solutions end up being blocked by the love of power, whereas instead wouldn't it perhaps be better if we could all get up, align our purposes and come from the power of love to see these solutions through. floods. I suppose just like millions of people did. But for me, watching them on TV just wasn't enough. I felt I had to come myself and see what had happened and how the people were affected. Crying. When the flood comes, uh, this, uh, this, our houses were doing like this, like this. Pakistan's Prime Minister today described the floods devastating his country as the worst in its history. And how high was the mud? Uh, when the flood comes, so. If you look at world poverty today you know we have six billion people on the planet you know the, the world economy you know is huge it's ginormous when you look around you here what people really need is quite humble existence here it only takes each of us to give a very small amount and I believe we could almost eliminate poverty From this determination to overcome crises, new and creative solutions can be born. I am 
quite literally clambering over the roofs of people's homes. Problems are evolutionary drivers. This is true of your own life. It's driving you. You don't always respond, but if you do, you'll probably find you're going towards something more creative. Problems are evolutionary drivers. Crises often precede transformation and innovation. So when you feel a crisis coming on in your own life or in the world, look for what's innovative. From my experience, crisis can often lead to wonderful new beginnings. While I was at university, I used to go rock climbing during a day, mountaineering in the holidays, and then I used to party most of the night. I just loved dancing. I used to dance at least five times a week. But unfortunately, there was this downside to this hedonistic lifestyle. And as the years went on, my life turned into a complete disaster. During that time, I started getting increasingly tired and ended up having an ice climbing accident where I fractured my spine. And from then, I ended up having eight whole years in bed with chronic fatigue syndrome, staring up at a blank ceiling. But I even had to do my university exams from a wheelchair. At that time, I felt my life was completely over. I had almost no choices. I was feeling completely isolated and trapped. I didn't know what to do. But deep down, I wasn't willing to accept how my life was. I'm sure there was another path. We all have our choice points in our lives that lead us somewhere else. The question that matters most though, is what will you do at yours? My career started in New York City working for the heads of uh, the Futures and Options business and moved quite quickly to running a team over in London, onboarding clients and legal negotiations. I ended up in uh, management and over a 15-year career in investment banking, a very short period of time, ended up the global head of electronic trading and then a Chief Operating Officer and Managing Director in the city. So by 30, I was the global head of what I did, and I was, to all intents and purposes, the success as measured in the eyes of you know, the world at large. This is what you're supposed to aspire to. My life back then was really dishonest. I lived on a whim, I lived on a lie. Constantly from day to day, I was dishonest with drug dealers, I was dishonest with family and friends, I was ripping people off. I was constantly lying and, and blagging to try and get some more money, to get more drugs. But the most important person that I was dishonest to was myself. You know, I was like putting on a big mask. I was lying. I lied so much that I was believing my own lies. My mum was a typical housewife, and my dad was um, a typical geezer. He was a football hooligan on the weekends, um, quite racist, with some very judgmental opinions about the world. And for me, I wanted to become that person so then he could love me more. So I was arrested for racism as a child. I was arrested for violence. Everything that my dad was doing, I seemed to be copying. I was um, getting into drug dealing, carjacking. 
I had a few friends that would do armed robberies and I'd become like a driver. And even when I used to sit in the car waiting for people to do it, I used to know and think to myself that this was so wrong, that I was on the wrong path. But somehow the drugs and the lifestyle took over. I'm getting on flights, I'm making the money, I'm growing in the organization. And suddenly, I come back home from a business trip and life is flipped. I had, within a matter of weeks, miscarriage, husband having an affair with the secretary in the company and told that you might have breast cancer. I would go into work and I would do my job because that was the one thing that I knew how to do. So in my room at one point I hit my head trying to get some luggage out for the next flight I was going to take and I realized no one would know I was there. And, and I remember thinking, okay, I've had enough. And I screamed at the top of my lungs, I absolutely screamed at the top of my lungs. All I need is some help. I was on the phone with Dad, and he said, um, Al, how are you doing? And I said, I'm really not good. And he said, um, Al, you know, no one can take life from you. And I said, my problem isn't that anyone took anything from me. My problem is I don't feel anything. And if I don't feel anymore, and I don't see a purpose anymore in why we do what we do, I want out. And it shot through me like, I can't believe my father has to hear me say, I don't want the life he gave me. And, and it's that bad. I tried to pretend that life was great, life was good, but behind closed doors, you know, I used to cry myself to sleep, contemplate suicide. Um, I picked up tablets, but I never went through with it. I picked up the scissors to, you know, cut my wrists, but I never went through with it. I was at the lowest of the lows. I was in a very dark place in my mind, in my world. Um, I was at, you know, my rock bottom. And I'm not saying that, I don't know, I never, whether I had a choice or whether I thought about it, it just happened. I just stopped, froze, and just sort of looked inside myself. And then that fear kicked in, what was it gonna be like in prison? Was I going to get beaten up? What are the other people going to be like? I'm not prison material, what have I done? Just felt like my whole life, my whole world just completely stopped in that one moment. And the worst thing was the reaction on my mum. When I see my mum and see how much I really hurt her, it reconfirmed all the crimes and the lifestyle that I was sort of living. It just sort of showed me how much I was hurting people. When we come to the end of a cycle in our lives, we're at a choice point and the transition can feel like a real struggle. I was homeless on a couple of occasions. When I started John Paul Mitchell Systems living in my car, I was a bit homeless. I had a choice both times. First time, Am I going to succumb to this, oh poor me, oh no, or am I going to have the choice to get away out of this? 
First time I was homeless was 23 years old, and I had a son two and a half years old. I went up and picked up soda pop bottles, cashed them into grocery stores for a couple of cents, and made it happen. Just like a caterpillar into a butterfly, you begin to feel a bit uncomfortable with the way things are. If one feels a kind of unease or a need to do something, that's the first indication that you're getting ready to change. You're not happy in your job anymore. You, you would like things to have more meaning. As you enter a choice point and you start experiencing a crisis, you quickly learn humility because what you thought was going to work out doesn't work out. And therefore you realise that there's much larger forces at play than just yourself. Really a choice point is a wake-up call, a time to be able to read the signs and then make better choices for a much better future cycle. book seemed to just fall out from the shelf. It's as though it just sort of fell out in front of me. And I just seemed to pick this book up and just sort of, for that one split second, and it sounds completely mad and very woo-woo, but for that one split second, it felt like I wasn't on that prison sentence. It felt like the world just stopped spinning. It just felt like everything just disappeared. And it just, it sounds mad. And when I picked the book up, it just felt like I was so connected with it. It was called Moment by Moment, um, the practice of art and meditation. There were times in my life when things happened that were very unpleasant and I blamed it on someone else being the bad guy. Boy, did I get away from my purpose. I helped cause it. When I was down and out and making those choices, a lot of that choice had to do with how well you felt about your own ability inside, not the circumstances that you are in. If you feel and know, by gosh, I have that opportunity, and I'm gonna be a winner no matter what it takes. I'm gonna make it out of this no matter what it takes. You do it. The minute you start agreeing that everyone's against you, you start blaming where you're at on everything and everybody else. And then you go further in and further in and further in and you carry hate around with you as time goes along. That choice was, I'm gonna get out of this no matter what it takes. Because I'm here, I'm here. That's how it happened. Either I was destined to be here and learn lessons, which did happen to me several times in my life, okay? Or this is my time to be able to say, I'm a human being, I'm alive. I'm not a clam in a clam shell or an oyster in an oyster shell. I'm gonna do something because I can. I don't care what it takes, I'm gonna overcome it. And that was a good choice. I looked in the mirror myself and said, is this what I meant for myself? Do I recognize myself in this moment? Is this where I want to be going in my life? It wasn't all about money. It wasn't that position or that title that defined me internally. Where is me, the, the, the person that I I remember I was when I, when I was a kid sitting on the steps with a dream. Uh, where is that dream? Burke's dream was to be a basketball player. I decided that I'd rather be an organic farmer instead. But this all changed when he discovered the unhealthy effects of the food industry on his generation, resulting in the label Generation Z. It made me mad when my generation has been branded as Generation Z, as the most unhealthy and unfit and most obese generation since, I guess, recorded time. And that way I can have a greater impact on the world. What happens to people who choose to align their purpose so early on? 
In his teenage years, someone else also wanted to communicate a message to his generation. Well, um, I was 15 once. <laughs> um, I was at school. Um, and I think, like a lot of 15 year olds, I vehemently disagreed with the Vietnamese War. And students didn't have a voice. Um, and I thought maybe we could start a national magazine for young people um, to give young people a voice and to campaign against issues we felt strongly about. And so I worked out of the school phone box, managed to sell enough advertising to cover the printing and the paper costs. Um, and uh, my headmaster gave me the choice of either uh, staying at school and not doing the magazine or leaving school and doing the magazine. And so I said goodbye and uh, headed, off, headed off to do the magazine. What though if we haven't yet found our purpose? What if we're still trying to make sense of it all, of what to do and where to go? It just felt like every time I was doing a bad act, or I was lying, or I was cheating, I was taking drugs, or I was committing crime, that it wasn't me, it wasn't the person that I should be. It felt like there was two paths, and for some reason I was still walking that path because of these old beliefs, because of these old patterns. And I felt the path that I had to be taking, the more heartfelt path, was the one that was you know, more congruent for me, the one that was, had a feel-good factor. So every time I went against it, I felt like I was coming away from the path, which made me feel worse. So I wanted to come back, I wanted to come back onto that right path. It is actually hard to change behaviour and it's not a case of just saying okay I've decided this now and my life forever will go in that direction, we've got to work at it. Somebody scream and you all go faster! Every day of our lives presents us with an opportunity to choose, presents us with a choice point because there's lots of little patterns unfolding in life so any time in our lives we even feel I need to make a decision now, that's a choice point. So it does, we don't necessarily have to wait to the great, big, huge crises in our life. Just the, the, the moments from day to day that we really feel we have to make a choice to do something important, to, to think something important, then we really can change our lives and our lives will unfold in a different direction. Crises push us outside our comfort zone. We think, oh, that was a terrible experience. But if we look at them carefully, there were these amazing things we learned. I thought to myself, if I'm trying to get myself better, I might as well be helping others to get better too. And wouldn't it be good if there was some sort of health system that could work out what was wrong with people from the comfort of their own homes and help them to get better too? I didn't realise it at the time, but that was my own choice point for starting to align my purpose. Yet, I was ill in bed, I didn't have a clue how to do it, and I had absolutely no money. However, an incredible set of coincidences started to happen, and I started to meet the right type of people who helped me on my journey. And we ended up with a health system, many, many practitioners who helped many, many more. And the business started to succeed, and I also got better too. What's been completely incredible to me is how on earth, against almost impossible odds, did I go from being ill in bed to actually creating a health business? And what I began to wonder is whether there were patterns in people's success, of whether they'd aligned themselves with something that was far greater than their own selfish desires to help them to be able to succeed in life. So I decided to embark upon a journey to find out and met some incredible people to work out whether there was some sort of common philosophy that both helped them to succeed in their own lives but also go on to make a difference too. And so I woke up and I thought, right, this is the way we're going to do this. I'm going to allow myself to have madness with no limitation. And I'm going to allow myself to be logical and grounded with no limitation. As long as I've got this side of me intact, this side of me is playing. 
and I will show up and do my job and I will open the doors to all the rest and have a look and I will study it to, to check. I'll give it some time. So it was a survival technique. I called it having magic glasses. I decided in any moment to see it for what it looked like and then have another look. And when I thought I saw it again in another set of eyes, change it again. Continually change my perception on everything to give it another possibility over and over and over again. But how does this whole thing work? science have to say about patterns and how they may be affecting our lives. I think as a, as a physicist, you know, we, have, we are really all simpletons, you know, we study very simple systems, but I think, you know, the mutual relationships, the fact that, that no object in this universe is, is an isolated object and completely independent, certainly has got to have some, some implications uh, on that. The sense of interconnectedness is very ancient. It was understood by Taoists in China millennia ago. It has also been understood in Africa for centuries and centuries, the concept of Ubuntu that Desmond Tutu talks about. And that means I am because you are. We are interconnected. What I do and even what I think affects another person or or possibly the whole human population in some way. So it's not as though we're separate. We are all interconnected. When people act in unison, they act almost like a flock of starlings. When a great flock of birds wheels and moves, how do they know to move as one? But I have witnessed again and again uh, people acting together with enormous power. Well, almost universally, ancient texts and traditions have reminded us that we are connected. They've said that we are one, that we are part of our world, that we're part of one another, that we're part of the earth and the changes of the earth. In physics, we really tend to think of, uh, of us physicists as, as the observers of nature. But actually, if you look at it um, uh, a little bit more deeply, and if you ask yourself, what is it that discriminates me and makes me into an observer, then you will not really find anything behind it. Because after all, I'm just a bunch of atoms. And if you view it like that, then really the key element is not the observer or the observed, but the interaction between the two. And the observer and the observed could easily switch roles. So you could equally well say, there is nature out there making an observation on, on me, and that would be as correct as saying, I'm the one making observations on, on nature. Perhaps, rather than the simplistic view that your world is just created by you, as in the law of attraction thinking, perhaps there are patterns in the universe that are creating us too. And to understand how these patterns may be affecting us, let's take a look at what these patterns might be. Our reality, as chaotic as it looks to us from time to time, is actually built of relatively few simple patterns that simply repeat themselves again and again and again and combine in different ways to give us the reality as we know it today. Let's go for the big scale and look out into the universe, into space. The galaxy is about 200 billion stars, but they clump together 
like a kind of whirlpool in space. In a spiral, it flows in towards the middle. Spirals are very, very common as mathematical patterns from the huge scale of galaxies right down to snail shells. Go out in your back garden, look at a snail. The shell is spiral. If you look at a whirlpool, a little one maybe in a river, that's water moving round and round in a spiral. It flows in towards the middle. The wonderful thing is that when you look at these patterns, they're not just once-offs. They keep coming up. The same pattern comes up all over the place. Across all the world's deserts, you see the same basic five or six different kinds of sand dune. There are ones that just form straight lines. There are beautiful crescent-shaped dunes which slowly move. And then if you go out into the solar system, look on Mars, all of the same patterns of dunes are appearing on Mars. If you see a very striking mathematical pattern repeated on several different planets, let alone across the surface of the Earth, that says the same kinds of laws of nature must be operating everywhere. It's not just all chaotic and random. There are perhaps secret rules behind the scenes which govern how the natural world really behaves. Recognising that a plant is a fractal doesn't of itself say very much. It's just giving a name to the shape. But if you can understand the growth rules for the plant, the way that the genetics of the plant must be every so often saying, when you come to a bud, maybe you put out a new shoot. And then the rules for the new shoot are the same as the rules for the original shoot. So it's almost as if it's, it's got some little program that it's running, some recipe. And every so often the recipe says, when you got to this point, go back to the beginning, start again, but do it from here. Fractals exist everywhere in nature and the reality around us. Do these patterns perhaps connect and affect our everyday lives too? And what power does that give us to improve our destinies for the better? It's very easy for us to think that, that we are separate from nature. You know, we, we drive our cars to work, we live in houses, we walk about and get on with our lives and it seems like the world is happening outside of us, but that's not exactly the case. We're actually part of nature, and nature has these cycles which influence our behaviour. The cycle of the earth going round the sun gives us the seasons, but that changes the availability of the food that we eat, and that then changes the chemistry of our body. So what we're, what we're seeing in our lives is the way in which our biology is working is actually a consequence of cycles in nature. There's patterns in seasons in, the, in, in, in nature. There's patterns of the lunar cycles that affect people. I mean, I've had nights where my whole family couldn't sleep because it was a full moon, you know? Why is that? There's a pattern there. And as we understand these patterns and cooperate with these patterns, then it's like you get to dance through life rather than be dragged through life. So perhaps there are points in the cycles and patterns of our lives where it's easier to change and choose to do something different. When one cycle ends, before the next cycle begins, there's a window of time where neither exists, where neither one exists. And it's in that place where we have the greatest opportunity, where our choices have the greatest potency to change the pattern the oscillation, the cycle of the past before it begins the next cycle. So the idea of a seed setting a cycle into motion and a choice point opening at the end of one cycle before the next begins uh, gives us an evolutionary edge that perhaps our ancestors did not have.
So in, in life terms, what that would mean is if you're travelling down a path and you get to a fork in the path. So the choice point is you could choose to continue along the same path that you've been on in the past, or you can choose a different path, which would represent choose a different way of acting, a different way of behaviour, a different way of thinking. But the key is that while we certainly may choose at any time in our lives, and it's, it's good to do so, there are times when the physics stacks the deck in our favor and gives us the edge that allows our choices to have a greater potency. And if we're going to make powerful choices of healing for ourselves, of, of peace for our communities or, or for our world, to me, it makes perfect sense to, to use that opportunity. So if we bring all this information together, the picture that it is beginning to paint for us, uh, it is an awesome picture. It's an amazing, it's a beautiful, empowering picture of us as part of, rather than separate from, the world around us. We are intimately entwined and enmeshed in all that we know is our lives and our world. Finding your place in society, finding your place in that world, I think is absolutely key. I also believe that there are things we can call external reality that you have to be aware of. You know, whether those are patterns, whether it's a train coming down the track at you. You know, if there's a train coming down the track, you better get off the track. If there's a wave coming in, you either better know how to surf or swim, or you better get back on the shore. And we can learn to cooperate with these patterns. We can learn to cooperate with cycles and trends and so forth. The journey of success is about constantly learning. It's constantly evolving. You have to listen and, and listen to the people around you because sometimes you'll get clear messages saying this just isn't going to work and you just want to carry on because you've read a book somewhere that says never give up. But I don't think it's smart to carry on on something that isn't going to work and you carry on until you've lost everything. <laughs> I think the, the times that, that Virgin has succeeded is where we've been much, much better than all our competitors. And we've created something, you know, of, of quality, something which we can be really proud of. I mean, I'm here today in Dallas, um, you know, taking on American Airlines um, with um, Virgin America, uh, a domestic airline, um, tiny compared to American Airlines. Um, but um, because it's so much better, I think you know, it will succeed. Whereas when we took on Coca-Cola, who are also based here, um, Virgin Cola, you know, it tasted as good, but it wasn't something that you know, dramatically set it apart from Coca-Cola, um, and therefore, um, by and large, it failed. How then do you work out where patterns are going so you're then able to make better choices to support your journey. Life's all about not necessarily being an expert on the answer, but it's about being an expert on the question. And I think you can go through life and, and almost be fearless, but have the ability to ask the right questions. When I was ill, I really tried to understand my world. How on earth could I go from being ill to becoming incredibly healthy? And in doing that, I tried a number of therapies for at least a year, a year and a half to see what would happen. And I was attending to every single detail. I really tried to understand my world. Because it has uh, two tablespoons of tomato paste would be considered as a serving of vegetables. Yeah, he's definitely always researching and finding out new information and sharing it with uh, me and his dad. 
I was logging onto my email one day and he was beside me and he saw something online about mercury and high fructose corn syrup and he asked me, you know, what that was. I started looking into it and reading the ingredient list on hamburgers, buns, salad dressings, and even peanut butter and finding out that high fructose corn syrup is in almost everything. And that was pretty much my epiphany right there. And I said to my mom, me as an eight-year-old kid, that I'm not going to drink sodas anymore. And since then, I've gone deeper and deeper down the rabbit hole and finding out about GMOs and pesticides and herbicides and chemical fertilizers in the industrialized food system. Another way of understanding your world is to simply listen. Sir Richard Branson helped set up a group of wise world leaders called the Elders. And their wisdom shows us a key lesson in how to understand your world. The main attributes of a, of a good Elder is, is to be able to listen to other people um, and uh, not to um, always be pushing your own ideas. And, and you know, you learn, learn a hell of a lot more by listening than by, than by speaking. So, um, you know, so I think you know, as, as I've got older, I've become perhaps a better listener than, uh, than when I was younger. It's more important for people to look at the world around them and not just be within into their own little teeny world here. Sit on your porch or sit on a bus stop. Open up and look at everything around you. the planet is your life, you realize that many things you do affect everybody else. In combination with listening to others' information, Another method of gaining understanding is to listen to your own intuition. I think intuition is important and, and, and perhaps intuition comes from experience and, and experience of falling flat on the face and experience of sometimes succeeding. Um, and if I'm deciding to do something, I don't get the accountants in, in advance. I just, you know, I do it based on my intuition. I, I, you know, if, I, if I'm going to say trying to take over a chunk of Britain's rail network, um, you know, before we took it over, it was run by British Rail. It was dreadful. Um, you know, the trains were were clapped out trains. Um, you know, uh, I mean, I just my gut feeling was, you know, if we could bring in brand new trains, if they could be a lot quicker, um, you know, if we could, you know, make sure that people's mobile phones didn't get cut off all the time, that we could, you know. Uh, you know, give them good access to the internet. If we could, you know, get the staff motivated, that that we could make a success of it. So, so, you know, a lot of it is, you know, based on it's almost common sense and, and intuition. We are still learning. We are deep into the learning curve, and the irony is that we must learn to survive what we've created for ourselves while we're still learning. So for me, it makes tremendous sense to apply what we do know while we're studying the principles uh, to understand them even deeper. All of us are born with certain interests and skills, and these will start to guide you of where you should start to research and understand your world. And as you do that, and you start to learn about where the patterns in the world are going, and you align the two, that is when you found your purpose. And that service that I always wanted to make, and that contribution I always wanted to make to this world, it can happen now. And so I said, bring it on, you know. Bring it bloody on. I, 
I think it really is important to search inside for what satisfies us at a very deep level and then there begins to come a kind of a glow because we're working from an inner source of power. It's, like, it's almost like a little power plant inside. Well, I think we have a choice in life. I believe that everybody's born with a purpose and you're given a set of skills and talents to manifest that purpose in life. A pattern that is aligned with purpose can simply be one where others will benefit. Brett now is a guiding light to help at-risk teenagers break out of a destructive cycle and get onto a much more purpose-led path. The plan is to be able to talk to some of the inmates and engage with them quite um, interactively to help them sort of understand the power of their minds, to be able to sort of change the course of direction or change the path that they're on. Hopefully sort of looking at themselves and the behaviours that sort of got them here in the first place. Fingers crossed giving them some inspiration to sort of walk away from the talk and sort of feel positive about themselves and maybe, you know, choose some different, different paths and move forward. I just sort of looked at myself and looked at my thoughts. My thoughts were quite mental. I started realising how mental they really were. And then it says, like, focus on your breathing. It's come, something so simple and so, it sounds quite pathetic. But when I just sort of stopped and laid on that cell, I thought, okay, let's start breathing. So I breathing in and out slowly through my, through my nose and started becoming mindful. I started realising that I had all these negative thoughts were going around in my head. And as a kid, I didn't get that. I never had that connection. I weren't sort of like told how good I was or anything. I weren't told how, you know, how great you are, you know, how much of a miracle it is to be you, Brett, and how powerful you can become if you want to become it. Maybe you do think, oh yeah, that's the way I've got to be. Yeah. But I, I'm not, it's all my fault. I've always said it is, but I get, I get that point though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously that's a help. How helped you down that way? I feel like I'm a, I'm a loner. Yeah, yeah, I do feel like I was born bad. Yeah, I do feel like I haven't got a, a chance in the world. Yeah, I ain't no good at nothing. I'm good at robbing, I'm good at selling, well, I wasn't good at selling drugs, I was good at taking drugs. I was good at that lifestyle, I was good at being a prisoner, I was good at sort of like talking the talk, I had all the walk. I was good at doing all that, but, but deep down I didn't feel good about myself. Now, I was always facing that way, there's the drugs, or I was facing that way, there's the women. I never faced forward, I never had my eyes. My eyes were in blinkers, and I was always negative when I was thinking that, and I was negative when I was thinking that, not being good enough, always going to go to jail. And do you know what? I was creating it. And as mental as this may sound, it sounds like a film, as mental as this may sound, you can create anything that you want. You can create anything that you truly, truly desire. But I'm saying, once you start to use the mind and the power of yourself, for the positive reasons, you'll completely change the, the course or the direction of where you're going. Mate, if you can do that, you can do anything. He just showed us that just because you have a bad start in life, it doesn't mean it's going to be like it the whole way through your life. Whereas I thought, once in trouble the police, always in trouble the police. And he just proved me wrong. A friend of mine recently, who uh, studies these things very, very deeply, asked me, he said, Jack, what's the purpose of the universe? And I'd never been asked that question. And I said, well, let me think about that for a minute. And I kept thinking, what do I know the universe is doing for sure? And I thought, the only thing I know the universe is doing for sure is it's expanding. We know that from physics. And so I said, I think the purpose of the universe is to expand. And he said, that's right. And anything that supports expansion, the expansion of freedom, the expansion of consciousness, the expansion of abundance, the expansion of love, that's going to get supported because it's aligned with what the universe is doing. Here in Ulus Harbour, we have a beautiful game reserve, you know, one of the most beautiful in Africa. And I think it's in very important that if you have a, a workplace anywhere in the world, that you, you do everything you can to look after the community around it. The first major thing we did was to set up a clinic in the area. And this weekend, we, we actually brought a wonderful team in to help people hearing aids, suddenly being able to hear in both years. And it was just um, one of the most emotional moments of my life. 
I think you get the greatest satisfaction in life um, from giving. You know, it's just like it was like giving life back again. It was just incredible. Um, you know, we wanted to scream with happiness, and and in fact, you know, on the way back in in the vehicle, we literally did all have a massive scream for happiness. Um, it's a great it's a great feeling. We bring a whole bunch of entrepreneurs down here to have a great holiday, have a great time, uh, but also just to see how they can, they can help Africa. It's just fantastic. I mean, just seeing all these kids bouncing in there, just so excited about having a school to go to, and obviously the happiness in the teachers' faces and the parents' faces. This is my father. Father and brother. So now I like to thank my father because he pays me a fee to go to school. Now I have a manager of this class. So I like to thank you to my dad. Thank you. <laughs> So when you paddle into a current, you're actually swept up by the current. So in Align Your Purpose, we're understanding that as we align ourselves with a current, then we get swept along by that current, so we become part of that world. And as the world evolves, then we evolve with that particular world. For Alison, aligning her purpose meant giving up her wealth and status to be able to do what she was truly passionate about. I exited the industry ahead of the market collapse. And within months was full time dedicated to this business. So I started a retreat centre uh, in London, dedicated to helping people move through this journey. To many people, it would look like I was failing, like I was throwing away a job, because I did, I left the city. I left the money on the table, the millions offered. As an investment banker, that's what you're leaving on the table. When I said no, I'm folding towels on the floor in my center, believing in me. So yeah, there's a sense of starting over. There's a new beginning. For me, Inside Out Retreats is, is my childhood dream come to life. Everything that Inside Out Retreats is offering is everything that I needed to come back to myself. So it is my light after the dark. The notion of knowing what results you want to create, of actually knowing that is very critical because it's a moment of commitment. And someone said, at the moment of commitment, the universe conspires to help you. And what that means is that at that moment, you open up to the flow of resources that you were not open to previously. Well, I want to start by saying uh, thank you to everybody who has made this possible and who has created the space and the intention for our community by being a community already. We need to get the shovel so you can see the difference between the mucky clay that's what where yeah. the land was. I feel that I would really enjoy to have my generation to be Generation A. We need to be a more healthier uh, 
race of people now because just think the next generation will be, be generation minus zero and minus one next generation. I, I don't want to ha have very unhealthy kids. I want to have a healthy environment and healthy neighbors and healthy people and be able to have the people where they can make the change and be able to eat good fruits and vegetables where they actually taste good. Where it's not boiled until it tastes like a bland thing with a lot of salt. It's really good. How does it feel when you start to change and align your purpose? Fulfillment for me seems to have arrived in an internal freedom to to be self-expressed and quite at peace with both abundance and lack, with uh, both title and no title, with no business and a business, uh, with just me in, in, in my life. That, that is total freedom. I feel like I could show up. It's been a long time hiding. It just felt brilliant. It felt that was the different path that I was choosing. You know, it felt like that's where I should be. Hello. I found like the light. I know it sounds a bit OTT, but I felt like I found something inside me, which was my gift. And it just felt so normal to be able to connect with people. Pretty straightforward if you get a bit scared. You know, I see beauty in the most smallest things. When I drive from picking my little daughter up, there's this tree that just seems to speak out to me. And it's so obscure that you'd notice this tree in the middle of the M3. This tree just looks so beautiful, it's amazing. You know, I find beauty in silly little moments like that. Now, to a lot of my mates, that probably sounds completely mad and they'd have to take 10 pills to see that tree. But I don't need to do that now, I've got that buzz. Or opening my eyes in the morning and listening to the birds whistle outside. I used to want to shoot the birds because I was so paranoid at four in the morning that I could hear them start and I started to start another paranoid day. But now I wake up to the beauty of them, listening to them birds whistle. I do truly believe that changing the life of one person is like the changing the life of a nation. You know, everything has to have a beginning. What I want to do is not only build the village, but I also want to rebuild the economy in the village. So each of the homes that I've built, I've made sure that everybody in the village has been part of that journey, whether he's a bricklayer, whether he's a plasterer, whether he's just a simple labourer. Once you do that, you're on a journey, and a journey of recovery, which is really what this is about. When you actually come here personally, and you're physically handing, the certificates out to people to say this is now your home and you own it. I think nothing can replace that expression on somebody's face, that gratitude, but I think it's very rewarding for me too. If people during their choice point took a step back, examined more closely what their purposes could be and then realigned those with where patterns are going, we would much more easily be able to turn all of the problems in society into solutions. The little old man has shown himself willing to make a supreme sacrifice. Gandhi 
had a very strong purpose, and he was able to get everybody to join with him. And so if you have a strong purpose, it's one thing to find out what it is, and then to say yes to it, and then you have to make the changes in order to do it. One of the fundamental principles that comes to light again and again and again is that when we choose to change something in our lives, the, the healing or the health of our bodies, or the physical reality around us, that it's not enough to simply think about the change or wish or hope for the change, that we must become in our lives the very things that we choose to experience in our world. We must become the healing. We must become the cooperation. We must become the peace. And to the best of our abilities, live that principle every moment of every day in our lives before we can actually experience it in our world. I think what often happens is we always think about the world's going to get better if only those people out there would change. And the fact is the change that has to start within ourselves. You know, there, there will continue to be conflict in the outer world as long as there's conflict inside the individual. What is it about myself that I'm seeing in the world around me that I'd like to change? Something that maybe I don't like in the world or I don't like. Uh, uh, in, in my family or in my workplace or something like that. How does that relate to something that I am or that I claim in my personal life? And, and I think this is where the great leaps in personal growth occur is the honesty. I change the world I see by first changing it in me. It's about creating uh, change in the world around you by change in your heart, change in your belief systems, change in your perceptions of the world around you. And that is about being the, the change that you want to see in the world. I, I think everybody can make a difference in the world. I mean, you know, some, some obviously only in a quite a small way, um, you know, some, some in a big way. You don't have to be a politician. You don't have to be a wealthy person. You don't have to be empowered. You can be any living thing on this world. And if you just walked down the street and smiled at someone coming your way, you're already exchanging happiness and giving out the love. If you see someone that needs a helping hand, you don't need money to do it. Just put yourself there and give them a helping hand. Everybody can make a positive difference. to get away from the power of power and ego and go to the power of love. And the way you do that is you start doing something that benefits others, not wanting anything in return. What you get in return is so much love and fulfillment that you've accomplished this, you have the greatest power of them all. And it's not, I have this, I have this, look at me everybody, I'm special. The greatest power of them all was you were able to help people through love and they love you back. That's the greatest of all powers and the planet is changing right now in that direction. So we started Grow Appalachia and we planted our first 100 gardens two years ago. The goal was to take within five to seven years and feed half of Appalachia feeding themselves. We feed them give them equipment, give them all the seeds they want, and they can return help some of their neighbors along the way. A young man who used to work at the settlement school came to us and he said, would you like to participate in a gardening grant? What will happen is that you'll get money for seeds and for tools, and then workers will come to your garden four to five times a year through your growing season. They'll have workshops that will help you to learn how to grow because I knew nothing about how to grow anything when I first started Grow Appalachia. We're moving ahead, we're exactly on target. We're not giving away charity, we're helping people help themselves. That first year of Grow Appalachia, we probably had more food than we knew what to do with. 
we planted corn, potatoes, tomatoes, cantaloupe, which that didn't do well. The turtle ate the cantaloupe. I was very mad at the turtle. And we were able to make those last all winter and well into the summer. In Central Appalachia, there's a really strong culture of giving. So most families are giving away all the produce they grow except what they're eating and what they're preserving for themselves. People also feel that if they've been helped by Grow Appalachia, they should be giving back. If John Paul is going to give us his money, we should be giving everybody else our food. I talked to mom and dad and we, I actually wrote a letter to John Paul DeGiorio to thank him for giving the money for Grow Appalachia because it was wonderful. Sorry. <laughs> it was wonderful for our family. And to be able to see how that little tiny area of land could produce so much food, for me it was, and truly still is, overwhelming. <laughs> and I know that a person shouldn't get this emotional about a garden, but it really has been a wonderful experience. Initially, when, when I... I had a vision to, to establish a center. I thought I would be doing it on my own. And what came forward in opening our doors is everyone showing up in themselves to exchange service. So um, the, we had the builder do the, do the walls and we had the creative person show up and make our cards and, and see things for us. My own sister is a graphic designer and she said, let me help. All of a sudden it gave everyone permission to bring their gifts forward to show up in exactly who they are so we could fit together as a puzzle piece and make it happen. A major key to getting your life on the right track is to align your purpose with patterns that are much larger than yourself. But there's often one thing that gets in the way, and that's fear. You don't even have to overcome fear, all you have to do is do it anyway, to take the action, butterflies and all. People just need to talk out what they can say because I had a difference just by having a five minute talk on the internet. So just don't mind the fear, go through it and you'll have a great time. It seems to me like corporations are always trying to get kids, like me, to get their parents to buy stuff that really isn't good for us or the planet. I've spoken at different TEDx events, uh, conferences, in food and farming classes, and it's just been such an amazing experience and an amazing opportunity for me to go out there and be able to make a difference in the world. Everyone is afraid. It's absolutely natural. And the people who are most posturing as being the toughest folks are afraid. Someone says, uh, I don't believe in that touchy-feely crap. You know? And what are they saying? They're saying, I know that I've been going through life leaving behind a trail of human debris. I know that I'm destroying the systems I live in. But the notion of changing terrifies me. I got to the point where I'm going, you know, fire me if you don't want this. So I'm going to say the things that other people won't say in order to make a difference around here. But it would take courage to, to do that. It would take willingness to stand exposed and look like a fool to say something not only polar opposite of what the leader is saying, but also sometimes out of, out of left field. Einstein said that we can't solve a problem using the same consciousness that created it. We have to somehow shift the perspective that we're coming from. I think w one of the most positive things we could do is identify the choice points in each 
field. Identify the innovations that are working and celebrate them, connect them, and continually communicate what's working. And invite everybody, not just the great innovators, to add their particular creative contribution. And I'd like to see an internet site comparable to a nervous system for humanity. We could call it a synergy engine. And a synergy engine would help people anywhere put in what they want to create, find their partners, add their gift into the fields where these great innovations are already working. Choice Point Movement uses a social network built so that those of us who want to both change ourselves and the world are able to share our ideas, find and then collaborate with each other. I believe that the world is, we're trying to build a big puzzle in this world. One big picture that is, uh, that is brought together, that every, everybody serving in the, the thing they were here to be and the thing they were here to do and to fill the, fulfill the puzzle piece they are meant to be in their shape, size, color. If, if everybody was doing that, we could line each other up and actually create the picture here, a new one, a new opportunity, a new generation. My role or my purpose in, in life is to help people come to the individuality of themselves so they can serve and connect on that and create this picture of, of, a, of a different world. Every single person can bring about change. We can all bring about change. We are so embedded in social networks in life that everything that we do is, con is contagious. I, I am a great believer in the idea that a small group of people with compassion and kindness in their hearts can change the world. And evidence from social network research is beginning to lend great support to that idea because our emotions are contagious, our behaviours are contagious. And if every single thing that we do is always having a ripple effect, it's always impacting on the people around us. If my primary perspective is, is joy and really enjoying this life, then I want to be with other people who are doing that, who are energetic, enterprising, creative, and we will have a ball together. The population of the world is facing a global choice point in a time where our individual choices made today have a far greater impact on the world at large than in any other previous period. And the wonderful thing about going through this crisis is it gives us this amazing opportunity to take a step back, understand our world, and then take the choice to align our purpose so that a lot of the world's problems can suddenly turn into the world's solutions and collectively create the world we all want to live in. Together, through our individual contributions, we are the change. Each time the cycle comes to an end, it opens a window of opportunity called a choice point. Choice. And we will want to share wisdom by helping to connect voices all over the world. What we're trying to do is sort of get a rallying cry of everybody who's working in businesses, who's running businesses, to join together, to get out there and, uh, and just make, make a difference. Some, some people are very small difference, some people are big difference. We are just so very gifted. Would you do it again? Yeah. Take that leap of faith and enjoy and embrace life. We are incredibly resourceful and we can make things happen.
really the solution is everybody finding that deeper life purpose and going for it. And then sending off ripples. And knowing that that purpose, when you're fully aligned with it, is aligned with the purpose of the universe at that moment in time, you're going to have an extraordinary life. I'm changing more than my life, I'm changing the world. Thank you.